Hey everyone, what's up? It's good to see you. My name is Caleb, this is Theophile. Here we talk about books that talk about God and we talk about them kindly. I'm glad you're here. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna finish up my summary of N.T. Wright's book, Jesus and the Victory of God, or Jatbog for short, his big blue book. And remember, the big structure of this book is simply that Wright wants to paint a historically reliable picture of the most important man who's ever lived or at least the most famous man who's ever lived, Jesus of Nazareth. And Wright's method for going about this is pretty straightforward. First, he wants to understand how Jesus would have been understood by his first century contemporaries. Using their categories, how would they have perceived Jesus? Being very careful to not retrojectively put on him our developed theological categories. And that's not because our theological categories are bad or wrong, but it's just not history. History is asking how would Jesus have been understood by the people in the first century. And at the end of all of those chapters, Wright draws a lot of conclusions, but his basic conclusion is that Jesus would have been understood by people in the crowd, as it were, as a Jewish prophet claiming to inaugurate the long-awaited kingdom. Now, that doesn't mean everyone in the crowds really believed he was a true prophet or really believed he really did inaugurate the kingdom, but everyone would have understood that that's what he was claiming to be. Then, after that, Wright moves from the outside to the inside and asks some questions of Jesus's psychology. Not what did they think he was, but who did he think he was? And Wright asks three questions of Jesus' psychology. One, did Jesus think he was the Messiah? And Wright answered that question in the affirmative, and we covered that in the last video. The next two questions are, did Jesus know he was going to die? And if he did know his crucifixion was coming, did he give it any theological weight? So there were some scholars who were students of Boltmann who said that Jesus was dragged kicking and screaming to the cross. Of course he didn't know he was going to be crucified. If he knew, he wouldn't have gone to Jerusalem. And if he did know he was going to be crucified, of course he didn't develop an atonement theology before his own death. None of us develop theologies for our own death. Why would Jesus be any different? So Wright takes that on. Did Jesus know he would die? And if he did, did he develop a theology for his death before it came? Then the final question, the psychological question, the mothership, did Jesus think he was God? Or is that too a later theological category which we've developed and then plastered on the historical Jesus of Nazareth? So let's take those two psychological questions in a row. So first, did Jesus know he was going to be crucified? And if he did, did he anticipate that event would hold theological weight? Wright argues that Jesus did expect to be persecuted and maybe even martyred in the specific form of crucifixion. And here's why. Remember, Jesus basically thought of himself as a Jewish prophet. And it's actually a staple of Jesus' ministry to point out that Israel's prophets were always the persecuted minority. They were martyred by pagan nations and by false religious Jewish authorities. So if Jesus thought of himself as the final member in a long line of persecuted Jewish prophets, Wright argues that it makes historical sense to believe that Jesus expected persecution and that Jesus would not have resisted that persecution because Jesus' ethic was pretty pacifistic. He said things like turn the other cheek and pray for those who persecute you. He said things like give your enemy a cloak if he asks for your tunic and if the government forces you to walk one mile, go with them two miles. So that's why Jesus, in Wright's telling of the story, rides into Jerusalem expecting persecution and ready to not resist. But then the question is, would Jesus have attributed to that coming persecution any theological significance? And Wright wants to say that actually, yes, Jesus would have laid in that coming event with the theological weight and it wouldn't have been in Jesus's mind just like the death of Isaiah or Amos or any one of the prophets of old because Jesus believed the big grand story that was in the mind of most Second Temple Jews. And this story is one Wright has told time and time again in the first and second volumes of this project. And here's the big story that most Jews at that time believed. The God of Israel was the God of the whole world and he created the whole world to work with humanity to build a good world. But humans have given their allegiance to dark powers. They are now guilty before God and slaves of these dark powers. So God had a rescue plan to get humans back from these dark powers and work with them to build a good world. That rescue plan was Israel. God was going to call a nation. They were going to be loyal to him. They were going to be a light. Eventually, they would bring the nations back to the true God and the creation mandate could get back on track. But unfortunately, Israel herself had given her allegiance to these dark powers. She herself was now guilty before God and enslaved to dark spirits, so she goes into exile. And now, even though many Jews were back in the land, most Second Temple Jews, Wright argues, believed themselves to, in some sense, still be in exile, awaiting a new exodus, a new liberation. And so if that's the story that most Second Temple Jews believe, 
believed. That's the story Wright argues that Jesus would have had playing in his head. Jesus believed there was need for a new exodus, a final liberation from the dark powers, so that Israel could be what Israel was supposed to be the whole time, which is a light to the nations, causing the nations to be what they were supposed to be the whole time, which are humans working with God to build a good world. And Wright argues that Jesus believed his own death was going to be like the Pascal Lamb, the event which brings about the liberation of true Israel. And that's why Jesus timed his riding into Jerusalem with the Passover and timed his own crucifixion to line up with the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Wright argues that all of that theological significance, which is put on the event of the crucifixion, isn't later theologizing. That really would have been the story playing in Jesus' mind as he rode into Jerusalem with tears in his eyes. Now, at this point, Wright is very careful to not fall into debates about atonement theology. How does Jesus bring about liberation? Is it penal substitution, or is it Christus Victor, or is it ransom to Satan, or moral influence? And Wright wants to say those theological conversations are important and we can have them at another date. But right now, all we're trying to do is demonstrate that the Jesus of history, the human Jesus of history, really believed his coming death would be the catalyst for liberation that was anticipated by all Second Temple Jews. How Jesus' death brings about that liberation is a fun theological conversation to have at another day. But Jesus really believed that, regardless of what later theologians say about how that death brings about salvation. So at this point, Wright has set us up for the final question of the book, the mothership. Did Jesus think he was God? He thought he was the Messiah, and he thought his death would be the event of liberation for true Israel, but did he think he was God? And first, Wright wants to point out that Jesus would not have used our categories. He would not have walked around saying, hi, I'm Jesus, I'm the second person of the Trinity, I'm one in person but two in nature, and my two natures are indivisible and inseparable but unchanged and unmixed, and I'm about to die for your sins. Those are our Christological categories, which Jesus himself would not have used. But Wright wants to say that Jesus really would have believed himself to be the personal embodiment of Yahweh's saving presence. And here's why Wright thinks Jesus thought that. Wright quotes six pages of small print text from the Jewish scriptures and from Proto-Mishnaic scriptures, anticipating the personal presence of Yahweh being the agent of liberation, the personal presence of Yahweh being the catalyst for forgiveness of sins. And so it wasn't that Yahweh was going to use the Messiah, and it wasn't that Yahweh was going to use Israel as a nation to bring about their liberation. There was anticipation that Yahweh himself would be the agent of change, just as Yahweh himself led Israel out of Egypt for the first exodus. If that anticipation is coupled with Jesus' belief that he was going to ride into Israel and suffer, and that that suffering event would be the moment of liberation, Wright argues that it makes perfect logical sense to say Jesus would have identified himself with the personal embodiment of the saving presence of Yahweh. This is coupled with the concept of the angel of the Lord, or where sometimes in the Old Testament, Yahweh and an agent of Yahweh, the line between them begins to be blurred. Whether that's Moses or the Son of Man or the wisdom of God, sometimes God and the thing God is using begin to look like one but two at the same time. Taking that theological category, coupled with the idea that there was anticipation that God himself would be the agent of salvation, coupled with the idea that Jesus thought his death would be the agent of salvation, all leads right to conclude that Jesus thought he was riding into Jerusalem as the long-awaited return of Yahweh to Zion. So at this point, Wright has painted a masterful and detailed portrait of the historical Jesus of Nazareth. And this portrait is summarized in the final chapter, chapter 14. He reiterates the different dimensions of Jesus' ministry and how that ministry would have been interpreted by first century Jews. And then he goes inside to Jesus' theology and psychology, noting how complex complex and narratival it is. But after this summary, Wright ends the book on a question which hangs in the air. The question is, why did this movement continue after Good Friday? It doesn't matter how charismatic of a speaker Jesus was, or how helpful of an ethicist, or how brilliant a theologian, if everything ends with his death, why did the Jesus movement continue? And that sets us up for the next book, which is about the resurrection. So before closing the video, I want to talk about two final thoughts, and hopefully these two final thoughts don't make it too long. Final thought number one is I want to talk about my reaction to this book. 
I agree with Michael Bird that this book is genius, Jesus and the Victory of God, because it gives the church Jesus back. And here's what he means. There's kind of two bad guys or two groups of people that Wright is aiming this volume at. The first is the hardcore skeptic who thinks we can't really know anything about the historical Jesus. And Wright addresses that group a lot, but really they're not the main aim. There's already been a lot written to address hardcore skepticism. The real group that this volume is aimed at are Christians who paper over Jesus with their theology, who use Jesus as kind of the necessary narrative backdrop for the main theological center of gravity in the New Testament, which are the epistles, and specifically Romans or Galatians. And Wright wants to say that is backwards. The most important theologian that the church has ever known is Jesus, not Paul. The center of theological weight in the New Testament is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the epistles flow out of that riverhead. I agree with Bird that Wright gives the church Jesus back. We need to see Jesus and his actions and his words as endlessly inviting and endlessly intriguing and endlessly theologically rich. He's not just the narratival backdrop to the true theology of the New Testament, he's the source which gives the rest of the New Testament its theology. And I've had Christians actually tell me they kind of skip past the stories of Jesus to get to the epistles, and I think that is the exact attitude Wright is writing to correct in this genius volume, Jesus and the Victory of God. Okay, now my second concluding thought before I go is I want to make you aware of another book, Jesus and the Restoration of Israel, or Jetroy for short. And uh, Jetroy is a collection of 10 journal articles written by different New Testament scholars. They're all collected by um, Carrie Newman, and there's also a long essay by Marcus Borg at the end. And this book is full of scholars kind of critiquing or giving advice or little adjustments to N.T. Wright's book, The Blue Book. And I think it's a really important read. Nine or so of the scholars are really on board with Wright's project, but kind of have nitpicky comments. One of the entries and Marcus Borg are more major dissenters. Now, a lot of uh, the individual comments they have to say about why didn't you use this source or why did you translate this passage this way, those are all interesting. Some of the higher level criticisms it's actually funny, all get wiped out. In other words, there are some scholars who in this book write that Wright is too conservative, and then there's other ones who say, no, he's too liberal. And there's some who say he's following Schweitzer too closely, and then there's some others who say, no, he's not following Schweitzer closely enough. And there's some who say that he cares about Q and Thomas too much, and then there's some others who say he doesn't care about Q and Thomas at all. So once you get above the kind of minutia criticisms, the higher level criticisms, it's kind of hilarious to watch them all wash out because people have opposite opinions opinions of him. However, there's really one opinion which almost all the scholars in this volume share. They uh, hold it across the line, which is the idea that Wright, by so emphasizing the reality that Jesus announced the inauguration of the kingdom, sometimes makes it sound like there's not much room left for the coming consummation of the kingdom. He's too heavy on the already side of the already not yet seesaw. And so you can read the book and read the criticisms for yourself. Maybe that's true, but that seems to be the kind of one criticism of this book that sticks across denominational bounds. It's that Wright so emphasizes a realized eschatology that there's not much future eschatology left to wait for. Um, you can make up your mind on that. So I hope this summary was helpful and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.